nice, nice spring day. It's quite a change from last week. So I know a lot of folks are probably catching up from last week, but thank you for, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read through our electronic procedures to get that out of the way. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, all commission members participating electronically shall be identified by a roll call so that quorum can be established. Under executive order number 71, each time a commission member, staff, or other participant who is using audio only participation wishes to speak, he or she shall identify themselves in a manner reasonably calculated to permit the public to ascertain the identity of the person speaking. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the governor issued executive order number 16, extended by executive order numbers 34, 51, 60, and 71, authorizing commissions to meet and conduct their essential business by electronic means if the commission determines that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Before considering items on the agenda, the commission needs to determine by roll call vote that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the commission and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. All votes during the meeting shall be by roll call. Um, okay, so two things we're going to do at the beginning. I'm going to just do a roll call, and then we're actually going to, um, we're going to do that last part where we vote to say that this does um, constitute essential business. Kathy Frisix Warren. Here. Councilmember Colby Sledge. James Simmons. Here. Laura Coleman. Laura, I know you're there. It may just be hard to unmute. <laughs> so, um, uh, Jim Schmitz. I'm here. Chris Farrell. Okay. So, uh, this is one we're going to do right now. We need to um, have a, a motion that this meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the commission and the meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. I have a motion for that. So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Um, Kaki for six Warren. Approved. Councilmember Colby Sledge. James Simmons. Approve. Laura Coleman. Jim Schmitz. Aye. Chris Farrell. Okay, and I am an I am an I. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so we're gonna then one more one more vote before we have some more votes later in the agenda. Uh, I want to if everyone's had a chance to review the minutes from our last meeting, um, if you have done so, and I can get a motion to approve those. So moved. Second. Do I have a second? A second. Any discussion? Okay, um, we're gonna vote. Khaki for six Warren. Approved. Council member Colby Sledge. James Simmons. Aye. Laura Coleman. Schmitz. Aye. Chris Farrell. Okay. Well, we have some exciting things to share today. Um, I know a lot of folks are excited to see um, our latest list of, of grantees and we're excited to share that as as always there were really some wonderful applications and uh, it's always a hard process to go to through because i think there's there's always more um, applications we would like to fund than dollars we have available and this this um, time was no exception so before we uh, get to that piece i do want to remind everybody that we are going to have a public comment round if you would like to do that please do that in the q a and uh, Ashley and I will try to check that throughout the meeting and, and make sure everyone has a chance to discuss. Um, before we move on to the grant application summary, Ashley, um, if you can give us a project progress and financial update, that would be great. All right, had to make sure I was unmuted or else have to put some money in the jar. Okay, so we didn't re actually receive a lot of invoices this last time since we met in January, only two came through, one for Habitat for Humanity, making a final draw on 12 homes from their round five grant um, for the Park Preserve neighborhood in Northeast Nashville. 
And then one for round seven grant uh, living development concepts completed their footing, framing and foundation and a second draw for a home in North Nashville and work is moving along on that property pretty well. The financial budget that was included in the commissioner's meeting packet will be set up. So the budget itself will actually be set up after Hannah's return. So we can walk through it um, with finance together since this is my first time putting the budget together for the year. So the document might look a little different the next time you see it, not in amounts, but in allocations. Um, both extension requests from January for, for the round four affordable housing resources and round five 15th Avenue Baptist were passed in council this week and I've noticed or I've notified both grantees of their new contract dates. Okay, thanks Ashley. Okay, if anybody, if anybody has any questions for Ashley, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to. We're going to move on to um, the reviewer recommendations. And so, Ashley, I may just I may go through the list, but I think it's always helpful for everyone to know on the commission what what each project is and what it constitutes. So I may I may go down the list and say what they are, and I may ask you to give a little summary of, of each project if you don't mind. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we we had a a little over seven million to award this round. Um, it was some funds that were given back to us from an award that we were unable to make from the delay in the, the impoundment and funds that we had previously. So the list that we have for this time, um, we have Habitat for Humanity, which is a homeowner, Affordable Housing Resources, which is also a homeowner, Mending Hearts, which is a rental, Urban Housing Solutions, also rental, Be a Helping Hand Foundation, rental, and a Samaritan recovery community, which is a rental. And uh, five out of six of those are returning uh, grantees, but people that have received funding from us in the past. And as I said, there were some other grants that uh, we were all sad to see not funded because they were also excellent. I think it was just a very hard decision to come down uh, through the list, um, but we did have to decide that. And it was, it was an unanimous by all of the reviewers. So. We were happy um, that that was the case, and uh, I know we all are curious where these are located and and what the project is. And so, Ashley, if you don't mind just giving a short update on each one of those for everyone, that would be great. Sure thing. So, as Gina mentioned, we had a total of ten applications. Um, the actual requested amount was ten million five hundred. Um, sorry, ten million five hundred and seven thousand three hundred and three dollars. That's about three million dollars over what we have in our total funding pool, which is seven point four four five. Um, as you all received, uh, the review team had re recommended to award six of the 10 proposals, totaling 7.407278, um, which is 358 total units and leveraging a total of $97,692,470. I'll go through each application just briefly, um, and then you all will vote after I give the overview. Um, as a reminder, the review team consisted of five people, Gina Emanuel, as you know, she was on the review committee, Tony Shaw from um, housing program. She's the housing program manager for the Tennessee Housing Development Agency, Angela Harrell, who's on the call as an attendee today. She's the senior community development program manager for MDHA. Joan Fleming, who is a VP and residential lending and community development expert for Citizens Bank. Thanks for the recommendation, um, Jim Schmitz. And then Jody Moody, who is a VP at the Matthews Company and has some um, experience in bond lending for nonprofits in this area as well. Um, and Gina recommended him for that review team. So just beginning going through the awards as they were listed in the packet, uh, Habitat for Humanity, which is Village by the Creek. They are requesting 1.99580. It's a new development in North Nashville, not urban core, but um, they do have low board and staff diversity, but obviously very high program diversity is listed in the document that you received. Consistently funded um, with high scores. We've funded them five out of seven rounds, a great application and high capacity to complete. It'll be 32 single family homes off of Brick Church Pike in North Nashville for low income first time home buyers who complete Habitat's home ownership education and financial management program. 
And then this request supports the site development, construction, and home buyer down payment assistance and developer fee. Uh, Habitat is the only one who consistently requests home buyer down payment assistance as part of their application or proposal. The next is affordable housing resources for their Lanier Park townhomes um, project. They are completing a development which was stalled in 2008 after the housing market crash and the townhomes are in Madison, which is not the urban core, but they do have low board and staff diversity, but medium program diversity is listed in their proposal. Consistently funded with high scores, they we've awarded them four out of seven rounds, good application, high capacity to complete the development. The, they will be building 31 units as um, according to their proposal, um, single family attached townhomes in Davidson County. There'll be two bedroom units ranging in size from 1,000 to 1,100 square feet. And to complete the development, they previously built 48 homes in that subdivision, and this would create um, complete a phase 2 of that subdivision for folks under 80% median income. The 3rd, we have on the list that you received was mending hearts, which is a new transitional living um, establishment. Demo they're demolishing or the plan is to demolishing the current complex and build a new home for very low income vulnerable populations in the urban core. Uh, we have funded them in the past 2 out of the 7 rounds. They have medium board and staff diversity, but high diversity as part of their programming and they are um, building. 8 total units. Um, this particular proposal indicated that most of the units would be less than 60% AMI with 2 and 2 of them would be under 30% AMI. So a very vulnerable population there. The, the next 1 we have is urban housing solutions. Which they are building urban flats, which is um, redoing the Mercury Motel property in the urban core. We have funded them pretty consistently four out of the seven funding rounds. Um, they have medium board and staff diversity as well as programming diversity, but a high need for the vulnerable population of people overcoming homelessness. It is in the urban core and it's a large scale community impact with diversified funding and it is a multi phase project. And that'll be off of Murfreesboro Pike to redevelop the former Mercury Motel property. Then we have Be a Helping Hand Foundation. They are proposing two units um, called the Lowe's Lane Affordable Housing. They have a great work history, high quality design uh, for a very needed population, large families specifically. So the two properties will be over will be four bedrooms. Um, it's a medium funding consistency. We funded them three out of seven rounds, high program diversity, as well as high um, board and staff diversity. Um, and there were some application issues, but that does not outweigh the impact of the work and the work history with that particular organization. Um, and this would complete some other homes that would be built um, in nearby properties. And they had met a lot with the neighborhood to consider neighborhood impact as well, as well as their council person. The last or the next one that we have is Samaritan Recovery Community. This is a large development called Shelby House. They're requesting $2 million. This is their second time applying with a better application. Um, they are, are actually the highest scoring out of the entirety of the bunch. Hi, Colby. I'm glad you were able to join. They, um, their proposal had a high level of diversified funding, a high proposal support from all of their legislators, including both uh, state and municipal. I saw that Bill Withers is actually attending as an attendee. So thank you, Councilman Withers, for joining. Large scale community impact and creating capacity for Samaritan recovery, um, actually doubling their capacity to serve their community in a multi phase project part of the urban core. So that's a total of 195 units. In their original proposal, they did have additional units listed above 80% AMI, but after discussing um, with those folks that completed their proposal, they would not be using those funds toward the over 80%. AMI they only included to help our unit count. And then I explained to them that we don't fund over 80% AMI. 
Project Return is the next one. Um, they were actually the lowest scoring of all of our applications um, due to some of the application issues. We There were some financial concerns due to the unidentified lots. There was general merit uh, amongst the reviewers for the vulnerable population and scattered site method listed in the proposal. They do have a high Barnes percentage and it's not in the urban core, but it is um, scattered throughout North Nashville. They have medium program diversity as well as medium um, board and staff diversity, but obviously a very vulnerable population with ex offenders. And that would be for three, or I'm sorry, uh, six total units, and they are still looking for this, the last site. Um, they have four in current site control, but have not acquired the, the, um, the last two. And then the next one is transitional housing and work programs of Davidson County. Their due west development, uh, they were requesting 366,503. Originally, they did reduce their request after discussion with their um, with the person who completed their proposal, and they reduced their request to 295,000 to be under the 50% mark for Barnes percentage. It's 16 total units on a property that they do own. This is their second time applying. There were some concerns about the design issues and the high percentage of barns there. It's not mixed use, but they do have a facility where they provide tran transportation um, in Madison to their um, where they provide services, as well as some Zoom services on the actual property site. They have high program and board and staff diversity. Um, and they're using the same contractor as mending carts to complete their project. Living development concepts is the next one. They're requesting a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, great work. Obviously, we have a history of funding Henry Miller's organization, but limited capacity, limited financing information, but they did include some updated information about their um, housing fund award that they have applied for and some of it is dependent on a property sale um, as well as a high barns percentage there's one unit that they listed that would be in the urban core and one not and then those are primarily for low to moderate income families at or below 80 percent ami and it's a homeowner proposal and then the last one I'll discuss briefly is the Woodbine Community Organization, uh, their development on Elysian and 40th, always a great application. Tony knows what he's doing and how he writes. Uh, we've actually funded Woodbine in every single round, so seven out of seven rounds. Half would be in the urban core and half not. So they are. it's actually four residences with 10 units a piece. So the 67 units in their original proposal is actually incorrect, it's 40 units. Um, and so that AMI breakdown that you received earlier is a bit incorrect and I can have him submit a, a correction based on that, but they did submit um, updated architectural markups. And then um, they are primarily to um, so mixed income individuals. So there will be some um, units above the 80, 80% AMI mark. So that is a lot of information about all the different applications. Do you, does anyone have any questions before we actually get to the portion of voting that I can answer before if you need additional information about anything or as you went through the proposals by yourself, including the Barnes request per unit breakdown that I included last night, which a reviewer actually put together, Jody put that together, which is another way of thinking about everything um, beyond the program summaries that I provided you. Well, I, I'll say that at, at the, uh, the breakdown on a per unit basis, I found very helpful because uh, I was kind of asking myself that same question and getting ready to do the math. So you saved me a lot of work, but I appreciate that. Um, the, and the question I have is, it seems like on uh, the helping hand, that's a really, I understand it's a larger unit, but that's a really big number on a per unit mm -hmm. basis. And I'm wondering how they are able to maintain um, rental levels at, at that. It's a lot of cost. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I could answer that objectively. Um, as I don't work for the organization, but it's a good question. I, they are they do have the highest unit cost per um, 
per unit other than living development concepts, which is of course a little bit different because it's a home ownership opportunity versus a rental opportunity. Um, I would uh, make the assumption that the per cost per unit um, is based probably on capacity being a smaller organization and needing a heavier lift. Um, they do also have a higher percentage of fund, Barnes funds requested um, as part of their request. So I would assume that that is the that's about as detailed as I can get without knowing more insight into their actual organization and how they control their rental costs. Okay, thank you. Hey, Mrs. James, th that's the one that kind of stuck out to me as well. I was comparing that with uh, the traditional, uh, sorry, transitional housing and mm -hmm. work program. They mm -hmm. have you know 16 units versus um, the two units for a helping hand, and also just looking at the uh, the district in in which they were building. I think we have two in district three, but the trend, the transition from housing would have been in district 10. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? And I guess, and finally, if we were to receive more funding uh, with this, the ones that were recommended to decline, would that be in order as to what we would, you know, bring in first in first out? Yeah, so let me look at the, the program summary that you sent you. I did actually have the reviewers rank which um, funding opportunities in the decline section um, based on their willingness to fund if there were more funding available. And as they're listed in the recommended to decline, um, Woodbine was highest. And then, um, and that was, so actually the one that you're discussing was, was actually lower. Okay, mm -hmm. but I, I think also um, speaking a little bit to the um, the experience of the folks that were on the review committee um, that especially because they've received grants from THDA as well as MDHA that mm -hmm. they had a familiarity with the actual organization, which does put a little bit of bias on the um, the reading of the application. So I would say that there is a capacity building issue with it being a smaller organization, um, but they really liked that he took steps to meet with the neighborhood, the neighbors and the council person in that area. Um, and that added to the merit of the overall proposal. But you are, right, you are right in terms of geographical equity. Um, yeah. if, we're, if we're talking about specifically the transitional housing and work programs one, um, that the main concern with reviewers in that particular um, pro project, aside from some of the financing issues that were adjusted later on, um, was the kind of uh, smaller uh, it, design issues to the actual okay. property um, where they were also considering, yes, it's a higher unit count, but the act, it's a little bit more dorm style and the, okay. um, yeah. So they're shared facilities within the property. And it's always kudos to the, uh, kudos to the re uh, review team. Uh, I know it's a tough job to do. Yes. Colby, I see you've got your hand raised. Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I had a couple of questions for Ashley. You know, looking through the app, the grantee status, um, I couldn't help but note that only two of the the folks, two of the organizations who it appears applied were new. Was there any thought as to, you know, I, I know in the commission in the past, we've talked uh, a lot about building capacity, especially among sort of organizations new to this work or wanting to get involved with it. Was there any discussion about that? There was actually, I might answer that for, there's oh, quite you. a bit of discussion <laughs> about that. Um, I'm glad you bring that up, Colby. I think we all noticed that and, and thought that was something, you know, in previous rounds, we had specifically, you know, noted dollars that would go to capacity building. Um, I also think this past year we brought up, you know, some of the extensions that came to us could have also been a, a result of needing some more capacity building, not just sort of the initial workshop, but more extended um, help from our organization to make have them be successful. And so I think every reviewer agreed that we felt that was important, especially 
looking at the list we had in front of us, you know, fantastic applications, but also exactly what you said, how are we able to really make sure, you know, more and more people are applying to the fund. And I think we have to make a concerted effort as a commission to make sure that happens. Got it. Um, I might, I might direct this question then too to the chair, uh, you know, we were, and I, I want to thank Ashley for indicating, you know, which, you know, the districts they were in and then the districts to kind of rip the urban core. Um, I, I don't believe this was a sort of, I can't recall on this application if that was an indication or there were extra points or anything like that. I know in my context, at least, I was having that conversation within the council context. Did the review committee discuss that at all as far as the geographic diversity in, in relation to specifically the urban core as they were working through these? I think there was a lot of discussion of geographic diversity. I think, you know, the discussion was maybe less around the core and more around access to transit um, and high capacity corridors. I think that was a discussion of, you know, those locations were able to bring people closer to services, bring them closer to work, uh, transit, all of those things. But I, I think it was more a discussion, of, you know, general geographical diversity and less of, you know, funding things in the urban core uh, where amongst the reviewers. Ashley, did you want to add anything to that from your recollection? Yeah, no, I, I agree that there was some discussion about urban core, but certainly that most of the conversation did center around access to transit because that's what li is listed currently on the application and scoring matrix. However, I would actually make the consideration that if it is something that we're um, strongly considering as part of the scoring matrix that that be included um, in future application rounds as something that we're trying to make a point to address. Um, so it wasn't part of the scoring discussion. All, uh, and so, uh, you know, in order to be a, as objective as possible, right, um, we don't want to subtract points in our minds based on um, information that's not actually included in the scoring matrix, but I definitely see where you're coming from and it has been a concern of the commission for a while, which is why I included, included it as part of this markup and it's been feedback from council as well. So if we want to make a more pointed um, direction that we want to include that information in the future as part of the actual scoring matrix, it would certainly be at a higher level where the reviewers discuss it more in depth. Um, also, to talk a little bit about the capacity building issue that you talked about earlier, I think that until we're able to meet funding levels that are requested, it's, you know, we're not going out and soliciting new applicants at this point, which that's why we see a lot of returning applicants over and over again. People get used to the process. They get used to relying a little bit on that funding. Um, so we don't see as many new people popping up, especially folks that maybe focus more on programming than actually providing housing as part of their programming. So um, until we have a more sustainable level of funding, I would assume that we would continue to see a lot of return applications versus new applicants because we're not necessarily encouraging folks that focus on wraparound services and programming to start a housing um, development as part of what they offer to. Um, so higher level of funding, I think there's room to build more capacity as well as encourage first time applicants. Great, um, Chair, if you'll let me, Ask one final question. Um, uh, you know, we've got a recommendation in this round for an entity that we had a big discussion on last meeting um, about conflict of interest and breach of contract. Uh, not knowing kind of what the timing was in those conversations, was that brought up during the review process? It was. Um, we definitely discussed that and, you know, walk through what the issue was and what had happened. Um, I think it still consistently scored one of the highest um, out of the group. And, and so because of that, it, it is included. I, I definitely would like to hear from the rest of the commission, their thoughts on that. We did not in our last meeting say we were not going to allow them to join future funding rounds. We really just gave a, you know, somewhat of a censure and we are going to have a letter included to the board of affordable housing um, resources, uh, but it, it definitely given our, our last conversation would, would like to hear from everybody. 
their thoughts on that as they are in this grant round. Thanks, Chair. I'll withhold mine for now because I know I've talked a lot. Well, I'd like to know if the staff has further recommendations about um, affordable housing resources and uh, particularly as it relates to the audit um, and to um, how the council is going to perceive that um, they're, they had a breach of contract and then we contract with them again in the next round. If y'all have given it more thought and have any other recommendations. So that was a question for the staff. Does it, either Macy or Ashley, have y'all, have, do y'all have any other recommendations for us? Um, objectively, if I'm talking specifically about the proposal and the application, I would say that it is definitely one that merited funding as a proposal. That being said, from a non-objective point of view, I think that it does not necessarily send a great message, and I don't think that it would read well with Metro Council. Um, now, you can certainly make a case for it and, and the why behind it if it's, you know, there's a large impact on the community. Um, but I don't, I also don't think um, that pushing that funding to a different round um, would impact the work um, since that work has not started. So that is another consideration to, to think about. Um, you know, not funding in this round doesn't mean that you can, you don't have to ever fund them again. So that is, you know, without, I'm, I'm trying to be as objective as possible and, and kind of coaching you through what you could do versus what you can't do. And I, I don't think that saying that they can never apply again or that they, we should not fund them ever again is the right decision. But I also think that um, we don't give, you know, negative points to an application right now for a contract breach, which is certainly something that we could think about doing in the future for any applicant. Um, so thinking about the proposal objectively, that doesn't include any of that information or subtraction of points um, that wasn't taken into consideration. Now, if it were, it would certainly have affected their score. So there's obviously a case that could be made as to why you pushed that to perhaps a different funding round and encourage them to apply in, a, in the future versus awarding them now. And then from a legal standpoint, obviously th there's no real reason why um, they cannot be awarded another contract. The commission didn't vote no to um, preclude them from being able to apply in this round or anything like that. So from a legal standpoint, um, there's no issue with awarding them any money. Uh, I have not seen their proposal or you know, I, I don't have any real comments to make about that. Colby, do you have uh, any insights in terms of the uh, in terms of the council? Uh, I think people would ask me that about a lot of things um, <laughs> regarding the council. Um, insight, you know, I, I think because because we had this conversation um, at the commission level, um, I don't know that the council has a lot of. Um, thoughts on on this on that particular issue when as a regard to contract or um, anything of that nature like I said I think the I think the thing that the council will probably be looking at most closely once this comes to their desks is geography where are these located um, that being said yeah I will speak as a commissioner I do have a little, I do have some hesitancy about turning around and awarding um, a, a, an award round literally weeks after we had this conversation. And I will say from, from like a process standpoint, I couldn't clearly say to council members or, or to, for my, for my own knowledge, kind of what since then we have put in place to avoid that from happening again. Um, so I'm a little concerned that we might be stating one thing and then our actions may not reflect that um, statement. 
So that's as a commissioner, I think as a council, I think there that could become an issue. I think the greater issue will continue and increasingly be geography. Well, I, I do also wonder, I, I would assume that it will result in a finding on our next audit. Um, and so that will be our second audit with findings. Um, and in, in terms of just the integrity of the fund, I think that's problematic. Um, I also don't know that not funding it in this round would would make any difference. So we probably still have a finding, I would assume. Yeah. Macy, can you can you answer that for us? I, I suspect we would. Basically, I mean, I, I would suspect that we would as well. Um, but I mean, I don't know that for sure. But if I was an auditor, it would be something that I would put in my audit report for sure. Uh, yeah. I, I would expect that even if they're funded or they're not funded in this round, we still had an issue with the last round. Could we? Um, Jim has his hand raised. Oh, I don't know how to raise your hand in this thing. So sorry. <laughs> he was doing this. <laughs> it's all right, Khaki. Go ahead. Um, I, I was wondering if we could in, instruct our staff to um, bring back to us at the next um, meeting um, a, a concrete claim and a proactively addressing what we anticipate to be a finding of what is it going to be our policy and um, so that we can avoid this ever happening again. Yeah, I agree with that, Kathy, as well. You all may direct me to do whatever you please. <laughs> I, I'm happy to do that. Now, the action that we took, though, will be noted in the would be noted in the audit as well. The conversation and what we what we did there, right? Sure, we could. You know, the way these usually work is the staff has an opportunity to respond to the audit report, and so that could be included. I certainly think that by you know, in future application rounds, obviously the application had been open prior to me joining and, uh, you know, we had already received some applications. So you can't really edit an application while it's open, which was in October and before we knew of the contract issue. Um, but in future funding rounds where we to then add negative funding or I'm sorry, negative points um, to an application for an organization that has had a contract breach and what you know, even scale that or rank that by how recent the contract breach was, I think that definitely can um, appear as, you know, addressing the issue uh, head on and, and to, you know, at least try to persuade applicants from doing that in the future. Um, so that's one way and just off the top of my head, but I can certainly put together a more detailed plan um, before the next commission meeting. Colby, did you want to say something else? Yeah, sorry, I had to find the unmute. Um, just so commissioners know from the audit standpoint, um, we receive, council members receive sort of a summary of all the audits that have been conducted um, and, and sort of links to those, I guess is the best way I would put it. Um, but we do receive those reports. And so council members will have sort of I would say a higher than usual ability to, to access those reports because they will be provided to us. Um, and the audit office has been good about doing that. So I, I think that what we did last time in terms of having um, a kind of very strong condemnation of that breach um, paired with um, Ashley coming back to us with a, a really proactive way of how we're going to deal with it in the future in terms of points, I think would be um, very helpful. You know, in retrospect, it it probably would have been better if we said that they needed to skip a funding round at our last meeting, but that's retrospect and that's not where we are now. Well, and I'll say that, that it also speaks to our need to get more applicants. So we have a broader pool to choose from on that. Um, because if we also on the other side of things want to be effective and really trying to reach out, uh, it's kind of hard to do it with a smaller 
group and if one trips up it puts us in a little bit of a box yeah i agree with that jim uh you know in previous rounds i i feel like there have been a much higher applicant pool as well it would be interesting also ashley to sort of track that see how many applications uh, you know maybe next time we can talk about that how many have been received um you know and just sort of see where what has happened with the various grantees right and if we get greater funding levels in the future uh kind of hard to justify those if you don't have more people and that's a discussion that's coming up on that affordable housing task force you know getting asked by barnes if you had more dollars would you be able to fund it uh, I think the answer is still yes, but in previous rounds, uh, it was a it was a resounding yes because we just had so many applications. We had at least double for what we have now, and so um, I think that's just another um, discussion for us how we reach out to other individuals. May I? Oh, I was going to. May I address the application count really quickly? I think that. Um, taking holistically the picture into perspective as well after the tornado and COVID affected, um, you know, their ability to do a lot of things. Um, also, construction costs in Nashville skyrocketed because while things and businesses slowed down, construction did not. The price of wood actually nearly tripled um, in order to build in Nashville. So that I think also affected um, smaller organizations ability to do a lot of work um, during a time when a lot of construction was needed after the tornado and you know still ongoing. So I think that we had several um, effects to the application pool this at this particular round that hopefully moving forward would not be the case. Um, but Certainly, I can give you more detailed numbers um, from year over year. Colby, you were going to say something previously. Thank you. Short hand. Yes, um, just speaking to another app. I just want to make sure people were I know that council member withers was mentioned earlier on um, Samaritan recovery community and that being in the district he represents. There is an application recommended to fund that's in the district I represent. That's the urban housing solutions. Um, application so i wanted to a be transparent about that and b um speak to i'm i'm familiar with this location and in fact um had worked with the applicant on previous legislation where we expanded the um, urban zoning overlay um to down murfreesboro pike which included this this property um what that does commissioners um is thanks to a sub uh, a previous uh, piece of legislation i passed um, parking minimums are eliminated along corridors in the UZO um, for properties that front the corridor. So it provides the application a lot more flexibility in um, if they are serving a community, which I'm familiar with, with the community that they serve is not relying on cars primarily for transportation. They're relying more on transit and other means. Um, it relies on the flexibility to allows them flexibility to build more units um, instead of more parking. So I was glad I did not know they were applying. <laughs> I was glad to see that application, um, but wanted to give commissioners a little more context as to what the um, recent policy changes have been that will hopefully help benefit greater production of housing here. Thanks, Chair. Go ahead, Kathy. I was going to ask if anybody else wanted to say something before we. Yeah, I I had a question about one of the proposals with um with urban housing solutions and the Mercury Courts. Are those new? Con is that new construction, or are those going to be bringing on new units, or are they renovation of existing units with at Mercury Courts? I believe this first round. It's a multi-phase project. I believe this first round was largely. I'll have to look back at my notes. Largely, largely new that building that they are going to be so are they, is it is it going to be a similar kind of concept in terms of phases as to what's on clarksville highway is that kind of the general concept is this uh let's see you know, I can get that question and I answer it later. I'm really just curious. I just would like like to know more about what that's going to look like because I'm familiar with Mercury Court, so it's not it's not going to affect um, my vote. I 
I guess the other thing that I wanted to they did have a master plan, um, Kathy, just so you remember, I do recall seeing an overall master plan of how they were going to phase it. So that is available um, for you. Right. Yeah, I just, I just be curious to see it because I um, mm -hmm. like that kind of planning. Um, I, I think that I'm, I'll again just bring attention to diversity in our in our pool. And actually, at several levels, um, you know, I'd like to see more diversity among the commissioners that um, work with uh, the Barnes Fund. So um, I think uh, working on a strategic plan for that would be important. Um, I know last time, um, Ashley, I asked you about what it was the racial diversity of our review team. And I wonder if you could, because I think it'd be helpful for that to be in the minutes. I wonder if you could tell us that now. I did, nobody had their camera on during the, <laughs> during the review meeting. And so I cannot assume anyone's ethnicity. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, the only people that I have um, met in person or, you know, virtually is Gina. And then I saw Jody's picture online as well as Jones because it's included in her uh, email, but I don't know Tony and Angela personally, so um, I'm not able to answer that definitively. Okay. Um, the, the other thing that I'll just point out is it, when I look at diversity um, on in grant making, I'm looking less at the diversity of participants or beneficiaries and more at the, um, at the diversity of leadership staff and board. And I just want to note that um, we of the ones that we're recommending for funding, both of the ones with low diversity are recommended for funding. And there are more of the ones with high diversity are not recommended for funding. And, and that is troubling in terms of um, kind of um, historic trends in housing and in our talking about finding new partners that can join us. But, and I also think it's very rooted in our strategic plan that has been talking about capacity, but really not done anything to build that capacity. So I think, and again, I think it reflects less on them and more about on us about we need to do a better job in um, equipping, training, uh, partnering, um, so that we will not come a year from now and have this same story we had last year and this year. Yeah, I agree with you, Kathy. And I think that was definitely a discussion as we were reviewing the applications. I think it's it's not even just a one time, you know, what we did previously was great. We had the one time capacity fund capacity building grant for organizations, but it was, you know, that was it. I, I think it needs to be something more contiguous that happens over a long period of time through a grant round, through a project build, through kind of all the way. And I think that is that is something as commissioners, I think we should really, uh, you know, devote some time to making sure we put some steps in place for that to happen. Um, but I 100% agree with you. Um, yeah, it's, it's part of our strategic plan. And I think that we didn't have the staffing that we needed to be able to um, um, live out, kind of advance our strategic plan. I'm hoping now that we have Ashley and Hannah that that will be able to do a better job. Um, but I, again, it's it, we need to hold ourselves accountable. Um, I, I would be um, it would be grievous for us to come to the same point next year and be having the same conversation. I I would agree with you def definitely. As I was looking at uh, when I included that as part of the program summary that I included with you all, um, the board diversity was definitely one consideration. I also looked at the staff consideration, looking at both gender parity and the Great uh, ethnicity makeup of their staff is listed. Um, obviously, that doesn't include other aspects of inclusion, but I did look at those two things since that's what's on our um, diversity matrix um, as part of their board diversity as well. Um, their program diversity, I only could go off of what is included um, in their checked boxes. Um, so that's why it's listed there that way. Uh, I will say that there was only one application that was um, unanimous amongst reviewers to decline, um, but all of the other applications at least did have merit to the point that they would have funded were, you know, there was a an open applic I'm sorry, open funding available to fund all of them. Yes, if we'd had our usual allocation, we could have funded all. Correct. Um, I think the um, the main recommendations that were made and why they were made was based on impact, unit count, um, and other application factors, but not necessarily penalizing anyone um, based on 
you know, the proposal itself and the populations that they serve, because generally, all, uh, you know, amongst all of the reviewers, the consensus were, um, ex say for one project that scored the lowest, um, the work is incredibly necessary and something that they would have funded were there more dollars available. I, I do think there's one more comment in terms of diversity, and it actually goes to something that Jim said last um, a couple of meetings ago is that an unintended co consequence of talking about um, ethnic diversity is that um, we we push partners into tokenism, which is also not um, is abusive in its own way. And so um, we need to look at all the complexities of this issue and um, be sure that we're moving forward. Great, uh, Gina, I was going to ask if um, you wanted me to read any of the questions that were listed in the question and answer section prior to voting from the attendees. Well, Colby, um, Ashley mentioned you may have to leave at three. Is that the case? Um, yes, that's correct. I would like um, everyone to be here for the vote. If any, if any of the questions are related to the funding round, are they, Ashley? Uh, on only one, um, and that was just about the, the capacity building of the fund that organizations would likely be able to use additional funding if funds were available, if they were not limited to one application or to the $2 million award limit. Um, but that just has to do with how we structure the application. Sure, okay. Um, well, yes, I do, I do wanna come back to those questions. I may, if uh, the commission is okay with it, I think I may go ahead and, and say we, vote on this while Colby is still with us. And then we can come back to uh, the questions in the Q&A and answer those. So uh, the, the, the I have a question. question. I do have a question, Gina. So we have six of seven commissioners here. Is that right? And I'm just trying to think, it, it, I'm trying to uh, um, decide how I'm gonna vote. And I, um, want to know that there's not if if there's one dissenting vote it will not stop progress i see and i'm doing that yeah i think that means we still have a quorum is that right um ashley and and macy i believe so if you can confirm that yes okay so I am I am going to propose that we are we are currently providing funding for um, those recommended to fund in front of us, which is Habitat for Humanity, Affordable Housing Resources, Mending Hearts Incorporated, Urban Housing Solutions, Via Helping Hand Foundation, and Samaritan Recovery Community for the total of seven million four hundred and seven thousand two hundred and seventy eight dollars for this round. There is a if there is a second to that. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay. I'm going to do a roll call vote. All right, Kathy for six, Warren. Councilmember Colby Sledge? Aye. Jeff Simmons? Aye. Laura Coleman? Aye. Jim Schmidt? Aye. Chris Farrell? Okay, so I believe we have a quorum and uh, and those will move forward into the funding process. So thank you everybody and I, I appreciate the discussion very much. It's good to have that every time we, we do this. Um, okay, so if we want to go back to the, the Q&A, Ashley, if you want to look at those questions, that would be great. Sure thing. The first question is, what is the likelihood that Amazon funds would come to Barnes? We are working on a proposal for Amazon, but that um, has not been submitted th to them yet. So nothing definitive. Um, so there is no percentage of chance because we have not submitted anything. I think I could answer that question. And of course the commission would be made aware um, what the ask is of Amazon were we to move forward with that. Oh, can I ask then why we haven't submitted anything yet? Because right now the policy director, number one, Hannah is not here. So I likely it would be an inclusionary of other housing um, 
issues that she would like to address as part of the housing task force um, and um, as the director of housing, uh, larger housing policy and Barnes is only one part of that. Uh, I think also right now they are working on an ask with multiple organizations and I say they, which is staff members uh, of the mayor's office currently working on a larger ask that would include more um, more organizations than just Barnes or just um, the mayor's office. So I don't want to go into too much detail about that until it's confirmed and an official ask is made, but um, that they want to ask for a larger amount and Barnes only is one part of that puzzle. Does that fully answer your question, Jim? Okay, great. The next question, um, or Caitlin Dastig from Rebuilding Together Nashville said, Hi, Ashley, I joined late, but would echo your sentiment and rationale for less applicants. We had, if had we not been slowed down by COVID and asked to join the tornado relief efforts, we would have likely had submitted an application this round. So just echoing what I had shared earlier. And then the last question on here are, is, are you anticipating a fall round? Could you not push the AHR to the next round if there is one in the fall? And can you explain if we have caught up now with the blip when Cooper came in and cut $5 million? Does anyone want to take that question on or would you like me to answer it directly? I'm happy to do. <laughs> Uh, we are anticipating a fall funding round. Um, however, it is contingent on um, the mayor's budget being passed for operations and that does happen in July. So I cannot answer definitively until that time. Um, we did not decide to push the AHR application um, because that was not, we did not discuss that specific penalty in the last um, conversation that the commissioners had about um, how to address the contract breach. And then um, where are we in terms of the cut $5 million? We did use some of the, we were fully funded at the normal amount for this round, but we used some of the funds from this round to make applications whole from the last round in round seven. So that's why there was a reduced funding amount for this current round. Um, and so in essence, there is both a yes and no answer to that question because we did address previous awards, but we are not currently at this funding round at the, the level we had been funded in the past because we had to address um, formerly recommended applications to fund. And that's it as far as the questions currently. Great, thanks Ashley. And there is one more thing, and, and some of this has come up amongst the commissioners. Um, Ashley, during the review process, asked all of the reviewers if there are things you see that should change in future rounds, um, whether it be the application or the process or how um, everything is conducted, please, please let us know. And so there were, there were several things that I, I think were brought up and noted. And Ashley, you have that on the agenda here. So I, I don't know if there are a few items that you would like to share. Sure. I can note some things as well if you'd like. Yeah, I would be happy to talk a little bit about those recommendations. Um, the recommendations from the reviewers um, were talking about the additional bonus points that are offered. Um, it seems because those bonus points specifically address a lot of wraparound services, um, they are the only applications that have the opportunity to get those points. And so it seemingly penalizes organizations that don't provide wraparound services. So how can we add um, other criteria as part of the bonus points that don't specifically address wraparound services or programming? So that way organizations that specifically do housing or don't have those kinds of services offered are still able to get some of the, um, the bonus points, which are of course added to the total score. And then also looking at um, large organizations versus that have a lot of infrastructure versus smaller organizations that are really mission focused um, and taking that into consideration. And perhaps there are bonus points uh, based on the organization size or, um, you know, some of those smaller organizations, kind of like what you're talking about, Khaki, that have a more limited capacity and aren't, you know, machines that pump out the same 
um, product that, you know, those folks still have an opportunity to access funding, especially because a lot of times Barnes is the first step to leveraging more dollars at a higher level and building capacity specifically. Also, um, there was, you know, discussion about capacity building rounds as well as um, kind of the, the differentiation and the bifurcation of less than five hundred thousand dollars as a part um as an organization budget versus folks that are above that and how they're able to apply for funding and then there was some um, consideration for the front and back end costs um, and uh, you know more aligning that to thda um, if we want to try and align some of our expectations to them or maybe that's um, based on best practices in the housing community um, also, considering the, the match requirements and the developers fees, um, that unit breakdown that I provided to you that 1 of the reviewers did, I think that's a pretty healthy way to look at some of the unit costs and some of the whys behind um, the asks. Um, so, either including additional bonus points that address some of the match requirements or, um, you know, some applicants include their land cost as part of their match and others don't. So, being really explicit in our policy as to what you can include as match and non federal match as, and what you can't. Um, that's not very outlined very well as it currently stands. So that's certainly something we can be better about. And then um, also understanding the scoring scale and how bonus points are awarded, as well as moving some of the H FHA requirements um, to an objective criteria that's scored outside of the reviewers because um, not all reviewers are familiar with FHA loan requirements. Um, and then I think, Gina, you had a, also added something about the design element of the, the properties and perhaps maybe there would be a way to include bonus points for um, the design of the properties and how it, it compares to the current housing stock and um, elevating the, the community and the land value in that way, correct? That's correct. So, great, thank That's you cool. for that summary. Anybody has any questions on that? Otherwise, I'm I'm going to move on because uh, you know Ashley had sent us a uh, the draft of the 2020 annual report, which I think is really great um, to see. And uh, I don't know if we're going to review that um, here together or if we're just voting on that. Ashley, I don't know if that's something that attendees have been able to see as well. No, the, the draft has been private up to this point. Only the commissioners have seen it as well as um, we did send a preliminary draft to um, the policy, um, one of the policy directors here as well. So he could um, think about that as they're working on that Amazon ask. Um, uh, but primarily, there, uh, as I listed in my original email to you all, there were only two changes, one to the map um, the map now includes districts. Um, that was a request that Colby had made. So we can see at um, the geographical diversity of um, where things are funded. I think the map could still be better, but um, I, you know, with the data that I currently have and without um, a lot of uh, labor intensive data cleanup that I didn't have time to do prior to getting this annual report out, um, I think that. I'm comfortable with this version of the map and its accuracy. Um, and then the other thing that changed since the last version you saw, the leverage amount was changed from 253,590,569 to 234,804,80. And that's because I realized that I had included Barnes dollars in the leverage um, and then had I had to subtract that because we can't double count our funds as leverage. So that's why the amount was reduced there, but that's the only changes. And one comment I had had, which I think is, is also related to, you know, staff and availability to really get that information in that Ashley was referring to is, is in each of those bubbles that we see across the map, that it would be really nice to know, you know, at the bottom, it sort of said a general percentage of funding was home ownership versus rental. I kind of also wanted to know in each district, home ownership rental, what level of AMI is it? And it's just more data. Uh, yeah. that I think over time, we will hopefully have access to. Yeah, and I, I did want, I kind of included that this in the announcement section, but uh, 
I do have some data requests that I want to send out to our grantees, both for current data and for historical data of their actual addresses um, that they have completed um, and which projects are open and versus completed versus still in construction. Um, because we're also looking at whether or not they were able to receive live tech. And these are primarily asks that we've um, you know, been working on with the Metro zoning and planning department so that they can have a realistic understanding of what the current housing stock is. Um, unfortunately, some of the data that I have just to go off of is not great. Um, and that's just of how, you know, spreadsheets have changed things data transfers have happened um so i'll likely have some data requests for grantee current grantees and former grantees coming up to try and get some more definitive data that i know is more reliable at this point versus what was pending and never updated previously you know actually that kind of makes me wonder now that we're have more rounds behind us part of the issue with data is i think we're talking about spreadsheets upon spreadsheets at home and i just wonder if there is any kind of um, grant making software that we need to look at so that long term we're able to analyze um, the data and know more about what we're doing yeah absolutely i have already talked to hannah about creating a dashboard essentially for not only the commissioners obviously there would be a commissioner view but also a public view of kind of where those dollars are being spent how they've been previously been spent um and maybe even some of the reasoning why i think that um the way that data is digested now we're, we crave it in such like bite sized chunks that I think that that could be really helpful. I also think that um, something that I would like to address, especially as we move forward, trying to leverage the story of Barnes and what we're doing is more design work on the annual report and and what data we actually include and what story it's actually telling. Um, I think that the data we include now is great. I think it gives a holistic picture of what's happening, but I don't think it really tells the story of the true impact that we've done because um, I think a lot of people now are moving a little bit away from the, um, obviously the, the number data is very important that um, quantifiable uh, data, but um, also moving more toward qualitative data and the story behind what you're doing and the work that's in those communities. So I think, um, those are two things that I, I've talked with Hannah about and moving forward, what I would like to see out of an annual report is a little bit more on that qualitative section of what those organizations are doing and how we can help leverage their story, both through Barnes and in their own annual reports. And then also creating um, a dashboard or some kind of, um, you know, grant software, like you're talking about and more frequent reports that are um, digestible for not only the commission, but for folks who have an interest in how housing is progressing and what the role of Barnes is in that. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Um, does anybody else have any more questions about the report before we vote? We vote on that. And Ashley, if this, if this is a positive vote, when is that going to be available to uh, the public to see that? It, I mean, there it's completed in, in its final format. So once it's, if it is approved, then I, all I have to do is have that added to the website. So it could be by the end of the week. Okay, um, so we have a, a vote in place to um, approve the 2020 annual uh, report. Um, do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, um, we're gonna do the roll call vote. Khaki for six Warren. Okay, uh, council member Colby Sledge. Uh, James Simmons. Aye. Laura Coleman. Aye. Jim Schmitz. Aye. Chris Farrell. Okay, great. Thank you everybody. Uh, the next thing we've got on the agenda, Ashley, is the extension policy discussion. Yeah, and if you wouldn't mind, I think I would like to parking lot that until March. I think that um, I would like to have a more outlined plan that versus have, I think I have a kind of a good understanding of what 
the expectations are for the extension policy. I think um, it would be more helpful if I came with actual um, ideas of what that policy could look like versus kind of whiteboarding and popcorn style going around the table now. Um, I think that would just be more helpful. So if you don't mind, I would like to parking lot that until March. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea to me. Okay, awesome. Well, then um, we're almost through everything. Announcements is that, you know, Hannah will be back soon. So I think it's March 1st. So we will all see her at our next meeting. And um, I think this uh, this grant extension request form you have on here, same thing. We'll just do, we'll, we'll talk about that next month. Uh, something else, I'm not sure if it's gonna happen next month or not, um, but Macy um, is going to be giving us an ethics training at the mayor's office. Um, has been looking forward to doing so that uh, I don't know if that is next month or not, Macy, but that is It'll we'll probably be, be uh, in maybe in April or May. I think our office is still working on finalizing the materials. We want to make sure that all of the boards and commissions are presented with the same information. So once that information is finalized, um, I'll work with Ashley and Hannah to get it on an agenda. Great. And that's going to be about 30 minutes and we'll try to push it toward the end of the agenda so we can get through all of the, the business at hand and then the commissioners can move on to that. So I, I do not have anything else to share unless uh, Ashley or anybody else does. I, I appreciate everybody's time um, and discussion today and look forward to seeing you soon. I think Kaki has seen everybody. Yeah. That's what were you going to say, Kaki? Well, I, I'm just aware that we've had strategic planning um, on our calendars in the past, and that's where we, we at every meeting, I feel like we leave with lots of discussion and um, issues dangling and because we just don't have time to do it. Um, and wondering if, depending on how vaccinations go and, and um, health considerations, if we might think about getting a strategic planning session on the calendar for late fall. Um, hoping that um, that it, it might be possible for us to meet for extended conversations. I think that would be great. And we've had it in August and September before, so we could tentatively schedule it just so that it's on a calendar and then just see how the, the world is doing at that time. Probably a good idea to get on a calendar because I think a lot of people are going to have the same kind of ideas for a lot of different organizations and it's going to be strategic planning October. It's that's true. Exactly. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll shoot for strategic planning end of September and <laughs> see if it works. But Ashley, if you could start looking at a calendar and circulating that, I think that would be great. So you can do it. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Great work, Ashley. Thank you. Mm -hmm.